people will be coming in during this session as well. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to day two of the International Energy Symposium edition 2022. Uh, is everybody hearing me well? Sound is good? Perfect. Uh, my name is uh, Boris Verhaak. I'm the chair of the TU Delft Energy Club uh, Master Students St Strategic Product Design. And together with my colleagues uh, in the energy clubs of uh, IIT Bombay in India and NTU in Singapore, uh, we have designed this uh, symposium for you. Uh, we will have a short uh, round of introduction of each club uh, before we begin. Uh, first off, uh, we have the TU Delft Energy Club. Uh, which is a student-led organization that connects students, organizations, researchers, uh, and institutes all on the field of clean energy. Uh, we do this by organizing, this is us by the way, let me, there we go, yeah, this is us. This is our beautiful team. Um, uh, we do this by organizing many lunch lectures, uh, excursions, uh, we do company visits and we do workshops to uh, solve complex cases. Uh, it's totally free to become a member. So if you're not, uh, please apply on our website. Um, and you don't have to be a Dutch student as well. So you can follow us uh, all over the world. Um, we believe, and this is uh, very important, that students are key players uh, to speed up um, the global challenge of the energy transition. And that's why I think it's really special that we come here together at this symposium from all over the world. Um, I would like to give the word to Matthew, who's going to introduce uh, his energy club. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Matthew from uh, Singapore and Nanyang Technological University. Um, I will be representing NTU Clean Energy Club. We are a relatively new club and we work together with the Energy Research Institute and Earthling in NTU to raise awareness among students, as well as um, we host, um, like TU Delft, we host uh, real world projects, have interactive workshops, and also um, open the doors for students and um, people, uh, people who are interested in energy and clean energy to be specific, um, to, to be exposed to the industry. And now I'll hand it over to um, the, the next speaker. Yeah, hello, I'm Anoki Mehta and I'm an undergraduate student in the Department of Energy at IIT Bombay. And I'm also the manager of IIT Bombay's Energy Club. Similar to TU Delft and NTU Singapore's Energy Clubs, we, uh, we're basically a student-led community and we organize various workshops and projects in collaboration with industry and also have a lot of fun activities for those who are interested in the field of energy. And uh, we also work in climate change and sustainability as well. And we have Team Zero Waste, which works towards a sustainable campus. And we're open, of course, for IIT Bombay students. And apart from that, we have several online sessions and workshops, which are open for everyone outside the campus as well. Thank you. Thank you all presidents from the different kind of universities, from the NTU, from the IAT Bombay, and from TU Delft. Uh, right now, we're just going to start the first day with the topic of smart grids. So Dr. Timon, uh, Simon Tindemans from TU Delft, and Professor Dr. Zaikir Reder from IATB, and uh, from NTU Digital uh, emission digital Rahbar Katoyun will gonna be us today. So I'm gonna want to give the floor to the Professor Dr. Zakir Radir to talk about the smart grids. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for um, inviting me. Good, good afternoon, um, good morning, depending on where you are. So, um, Smart grid is, um, is, as many of you would be knowing, is not something very new uh, from the conceptual point of view. Um, our grid has been in a different ways, been smart uh, in the past as well. But of course, the modernization 
uh, of the smartness, the automation, the technological development is in, in various uh, sectors has actually made this um, you know, smart grid uh, a kind of necessity to uh, handle this complex grid which used to be traditionally central power plant generating the power and then power being transported to the load center over the transmission lines. Uh, load has been predominantly passive. Uh, and that has uh, changed over the years. Uh, we, are, we have more active distribution systems where the distributed generation embedded at the, at the distribution voltage level. Uh, the, the energy is generated you know, more at the, at the distribution level as well. So uh, there, are, there is um, this bidirectional flow happening at the distribution level, which traditionally was not there. And then we are bringing in additional um, infrastructural additions to this energy system more on the electrical side. We are adding, for example, electric vehicles to it. Um, and therefore, in, in the, this digital era that we are uh, currently experiencing, uh, that brings a lot of opportunity to handle this complex grid more efficiently and effectively. This smart grid concept is becoming more relevant and more of a necessity to handle these complex uh, mix of technologies connected to the electrical grid uh, in a more effective and, and efficient manner. So therefore, depending on which from, uh, technical side, let us say core technical electrical side, you will have different perspective of the smart grid. If you are coming from the communication background, your perspective of smart grid is different. But altogether, it is a combination of this, this technical side of it, uh, layered over with this communication uh, side, then the digital side, data science, and all that that comes together. So this all, all different aspects of this multidimensional uh, this uh, uh, aspects are actually you know being uh, considered as the overall or, or overall smart grid uh, that. Uh, bring us a lot of opportunities, but at the same time, various challenges uh, into it. So I think without taking much time, that those are my opening remarks about uh, the smart grid. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Um, in case there is any specific format, uh, please let us know. Uh, otherwise, these are my opening uh, remarks. Uh, we will have a question session at the end of the each uh, presentation. Thank you, Professor Zakir Radir. Uh, maybe we can continue with the Simon Tindemans from the TU Delft. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, just, just a little point of confusion on my side. Um, should I just give some introductory remarks now, or I do have, a, I do have like a presentation that's roughly 20 minutes or so. Uh, yeah. Should I kick that off? Yeah. Do that one mm -hmm. or? I think you are the co-host. You can share your screen with us. Your we'll do that now. Us. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And apologies for just half for just pausing the recording. That was an accidental misclick here. <laughs> uh, it should be restarted now. Um, yeah, it's, it's recording right. now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Perfect. Here we go. So I hope you can all see this screen yeah. now. We are seeing all that. right. And my little cursor are moving around. I hope yeah. then I can point at stuff. Brilliant. Okay. So uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, for for inviting me to to give this talk, uh, I'm happy to be here uh, and, and glad to see a number of you in attendance uh, and such a yeah, worldwide audience. That's uh, that's amazing. So great initiative that you're all uh, yeah collaborating on this because I, I fully agree that you know the the next next steps and change are going to come from the students uh, now. So uh, yeah, happy to, uh, to to be here. Right. So my talk is going to be on a, a specific subset of of the smart grid. So happy with uh, Zakir's introduction there. Um, I'll be covering some of the same, but I'll skip over those a little bit, and then then specifically focus on how do we deal with a constrained electricity grid, and uh, why that's a big problem. Um, so to start, let me uh, start a little bit um, with saying that you know I, I won't start at a very high level, you know, climate change and, and those things. You know that, uh, but just still some very general remarks to kick things off with. This, these are some pictures about the costs of renewables over the recent decade, right? And you see these huge decreases 
in some of the uh, renewables, in particular those related to solar power, right? So we have um, costs coming down by a lot into this, you know, fossil fuel cost range. Uh, and the same for offshore wind, onshore wind, uh, you know, even at the lower end here. So basically, these things are cost competitive, right? And you've, you've seen that before, but that's huge differences and that creates a giant pool factor. Um, on the other hand, we have these kinds of things, right? So we've seen, uh, you know, reports that are more than anecdotal of various things that can be attributed to climate change, even though not individually and certainly collectively. Um, so, uh, you know, clearly we had those uh, plans already uh, and people are starting to take this seriously. Now, recently, of course, we have some uh, new global, uh, uh, you know, political uh, um, changes, especially in Europe that we're dealing with, um, you know, reliance on gas from Russia and how to deal with those. And just to to illustrate that, um, you know, that context that creates is we have these, um, here we go. Here we have these uh, this new plan, right? Repower EU was was presented a few weeks ago, uh, which focuses on diversification of imports, on energy savings, and on accelerating clean energy. So on this point, um, you know, here are just a few of the numbers that indicate the scale of what's being planned now. Um, we have at EU wide kind of a, a planned rolled solar PV rollout from roughly this number, 165 gigawatts peak, uh, currently to 300 plus already, well, eight years from now uh, to 600 gigawatts uh, or more in 2050, right? So these are very big numbers and that includes, for example, uh, compulsory installation of solar PV on, on the roofs of new buildings. Uh, we also have a giant you know, increase in the amount of Wind resources planned, we have specifically for the North Sea, this uh, SBR declaration that was signed to uh, install a lot of uh, offshore um, wind power. And again, so numbers here times, you know, times eight between now and 2050 or so. So these are big numbers. Um, so we have technology that gets cheap. We have these, you know, that's kind of the pool. We have this policy push um, and putting those together, you know, that means build a lot of stuff quickly. Now, problem is this. Um, this is a um, very recent map of electricity grid congestion in the Netherlands. Uh, so you can just go to this website and get the most recent map, <clears throat> where basically this is for consumption. The red areas are places where you can no longer just turn up and say, hey, I'd like a new connection, please. Uh, the grid operator will most likely tell you no or wait. In the orange and yellow areas, there are certain prioritizations going on already. And the stuff that's not colored, that's still fine. More seriously is if you look at the same map for generation. So this is current status now. Uh, before we implement all these nice plans, right, of rolling out much more solar PV and so on. Basically, if you're in the northeast of the country and you want to install um, you know, solar PV, then basically you can't. So there's a huge issue here. We need to do something about this because otherwise, uh, you know, all great plans are great, but it's, it's not going to work. So we have a number of challenges uh, here uh, that I split into threats and opportunities. And again, this is, I think, retreading a little bit uh, Zakir's remarks earlier. Uh, so on the one hand, we have resource constraints, um, you know, including just not the man or well, person power to install, you know, many cables. Uh, and actually resource constraints in, you know, in all the, the basic assets we need. We also have no historical reference for how we should actually do this. We have this you know, variability and predictability of renewable generation and behind it all, we have this very limited storage capacity. On the other hand, we have these opportunities, finally a sense of urgency. So that's making things move. We have all these new technologies and indeed we have digitalization and new computational tools, AI machine learning. Uh, etc. So in there, we need to do something. And the key word here is flexibility. So flexibility is what we'll, I'll be focusing on. So flexibility for managing congestion. So before I start with a few uh, uh, brief remarks, um, and I'll, I'll necessarily have to keep all of this short, um, quick 
mini bio just also because you know because you're students and you're at the start of this journey uh here's my journey so far um i started out actually doing physics theoretical physics then moved into biophysics um and after that i i decided i really wanted to tackle this you know this important societal problem so i moved into uh power engineering and worked at imperial college in london and from there you know bit of data science on the side and now I do what's, what I call stochastic power systems so everything that involves stochasticity uncertainty and managing those those uncertainties in a grid so I don't do this alone this is the the, the, the larger team that I'm part of at TU Delft so this is the intelligent electrical power grid team um, headed by Professor Peter Polensky over here and lots of other people there's more, but we ran out of recent pictures. Um, in a nutshell, we focus on four research themes in this uh, in this group: uh, intelligent power system operation, reliability and resilience, uh, flexible distribution systems, and that's what this talk is about, and then integrated energy systems. So that's all the couplings with heat, hydrogen, and so on. All right. So I'll be brief and mention go through three small topics in a few minutes each um, first i have these uh, um, going to look at general approaches to congestion management right so I'll give you a very very uh, brief uh, introduction to that right so if you're talking about flexibility then people different people talk about different things now on the one side you can and you should also talk about large flexible generators right improving the flexibility of the large units that have historically been dominant in the system so we have you know large units uh, capable of shifting a lot of energy and if you make them more flexible you achieve a lot but there's not so many of those and you can go down the grid levels go down to grid scale storage um, you know large batteries that you can install various places again um, more of those potentially uh, but less that each can do you can go to demand response from industrial commercial customers right so this has been done for well uh, you know over a decade now uh, in various ways right you can uh, contract large customers to become flexible and then you know for example switch off loads in case of uh, urgent issues in the grid and finally you have this what i call swarm flexibility all the little bits of small energy consumption or electricity in this case um, that you may be able to shift, you know, small bits, you know, tens of watts to kilowatts, um, and you have millions of those. And that's the long tail of this flexibility. It has a lot of potential, but you need to think carefully about how you unlock it. So, if you want to reach this swarm flexibility, how you how are you going to do this? Um, now, here's options in a nutshell. Um, you can think of it in, in in two ways, or this is the way I I'd like to think about this. Um, when do you want to solve the problem and how do you want to solve the problem you can solve it long term in advance you can solve it day ahead or you can solve it in real time and you can solve it using price signals right so you say well this is expensive that's cheap so you incentivize people to or devices to do the right thing uh, you can have markets in which you agree on certain changes in demand for example or supply or you can have direct load control where you just say, well, I hook you up to this device. And if there is any problem, we're going to turn up your, uh, your generation or down your generation or turn down your demand or so on. And in this space, you get a number of proposals. I can talk you know, for a long time about each. Um, right now, I'm going to just be mentioning static tariffs here. So that's long-term price signals and local flexibility markets. Um, so those two will come up happy to talk about others later so let's look at those static tariffs first right so if you get your monthly energy bill and i, I guess this might differ depending on where you are uh, but typically you can think of this as consisting of a few parts right so part of that is your cost of energy part of that is various you know vat green levies you know all kinds of stuff and there's this chunk which is the network tariff so these are payments that you make to the network companies to transport energy from wherever it is, it's produced to your home, for example. Now you can look at, you know, what, what do you want this network tariff to do? What are the objectives? And at a high level, you have these five requirements, right? You want them to 
often, at least in this liberalized system, you want them to pay for the actual network, right? Collectively, so all our payments should pay for the network. We want them to be cost efficient, which means that somehow they should incentivize good behavior. Um, you want them to be cost reflective, that if I use a lot of power, I might need to pay more. So that's reflective of the cost I yeah, incur to the network. But you also want to you know, satisfy a non-discrimination uh, requirement and some degree of simplicity so that people actually understand what they're paying or what they will be paying. If people don't understand how their actions relate to how much they pay, that's not very useful in any way. It might upset people. So that's these are very general requirements. And the concern is that those things are fundamentally incompatible in some level. So if you want simplicity, that basically goes against everything else, right? You can't have exact cost efficiency, cost reflectiveness, and so on, and be simple, right? Because the real cost you know, depends on everything. Um, you can't necessarily have non-discrimination and be cost reflective, and I can talk a, a lot more about that. But the point here is that you need at some point some political decision. You need some, some choices to be made there that are not just purely engineering technical uh, choices. So you can do this kind of analysis for various tariffs, and we did that in this paper. I'm not going to go through that right now, but you can, you know, qualitatively or quantitatively try to compare, you know, how, how different tariff options score on these uh, requirements, and then you can, you know, use that to hopefully inform decisions there. So that's one. Um, I'm going to make a jump now to the um, next one, which is controlling EV charging or discharging. Um, and specifically we'll focus on this project that uh, I'm really excited to be part of. Uh, so this is in the city of Utrecht in the Netherlands, where we have, uh, they have a really nice setup where there's one company that's been active for, for many years now, um, that is both a shared EV fleet operator and a charging point operator. Uh, so they operate all the public charging points in the city and they have an own you know, car sharing fleet. Um, so right now they have, use that to, to install 400 bi-directional charging stations in Utrecht, and um, they have a large number of uh, vehicle-to-grid capable uh, vehicles incoming, uh, so 150 this year. So that's going to be super exciting to, to actually play with this stuff uh, in real life. And I think it's the, the largest or one of the largest in the world of these trials at the moment. So um, that's really nice, and we're going to be working with this to um, to try and see if we can really unlock this flexibility. Um, well, let me skip this. The context here is really interesting. So in the Netherlands now, because of these maps I showed you, right, this, this huge congestion, uh, there's some urgent action. So our um, our regulator, the, the, the uh, competition authority, has decided to um, that network operators must, starting this November, offer at least 110% of capacity. Um, and that basically means they have to kind of basically, uh, you know, you have to sell, you know, or allow customers up to 110% of what they think they can handle passively. And this, at least this 10%, and maybe more in some cases, must be dealt with using flexibility markets. So there should be commercial options. Uh, and they, Basically, individual large customers, so that's one megawatt or larger, or groups of small customers have then the right to offer congestion services to this uh, to this distribution network operator. And they can either kind of offer services that are changing consumption or production, or some limitation in connection capacity, and the network operator is forced to then use those. So it's going to be really interesting. I have some. Um, some questions about how the well this will run, but it's important that you know, such things are being uh, are being tried. So I see, I see a lot of innovation incoming in the short term, um, and of course, indeed, this project Robust will start you know, test trading uh, under these regulations very soon. So that's that should be really exciting. And then finally, I'll use a few minutes to quickly say something about how we can represent flexibility. Um, of batteries, right? Because now, now we're just talking mostly qualitatively, um, but there are actually quite a few 
challenges at a, at, at a fundamental, well, say mathematical engineering level on, you know, what is the thing we would actually be trading, right? Um, so here, here are the challenges. So if you want to represent flexibility, right? And let's make this specific. Let's say I have, uh, you know, a thousand potential users wanting to charge their vehicle. Um, and I want to offer that flexibility on some market, right? What is this thing that I offer, this flexibility of a thousand customers? Do I share with you all the details of all these customers and when I expect them to arrive or not and, and, and so on? Or do I share some aggregate picture and what should that be? And you know, what complicates this is, of course, the meaning of flexibility depends on the purpose. Um, do I want short term, long term? Uh, do I want high power, low power? Um, do I want a certain amount of certainty or not? It depends on the huge heterogeneity of resources, right? So we might have vehicles that, you know, differ in how long they're available, that differ in if they can charge quickly or not, um, that differ in, you know, whether their owner needs them uh, to be fully charged or not. And we have uncertainty on all of these things at all levels. So these are actually really hard questions that are still not really answered. And, you know, the, those, the accuracy of those answers is going to make a difference between like a, a more or less good solution and a really good solution, I think. And this really is an, a multidisciplinary challenge. Um, we, uh, on the one hand, you have, I think, mathematics and control that answers these, you know, that could answer these fundamental representation questions. What is this object? How can we make effectively an algebra of these things? Um, how can we add and, and subtract these kinds of objects? It's also an engineering challenge. How do we robustly implement this so that it doesn't, uh, you know, fall over in case of some unexpected event? How do we uh, make it robust against cyber attacks and so on? Um, and it's an economic social sciences, uh, you know, uh, challenge as well. How do we implement this in an actual market? What are these products? How do we trade them? So just some first steps here, and I, I, I'm not going to go through the details. So there's a lot of, so these are really, you know, control slash mathematics papers um, that I'd be happy to, uh, to, to discuss, but, but you know, not, you know, in, in, in a short amount of time. Um, but what we, what we did here in this, this piece of work and there's references at the end is to create this exact flexibility representation of, for discharging only, uh, of a set of batteries, right? So if you have a heterogeneous set of batteries, all different say, sizes and shapes, how can we represent in a compact, uh, you know, robust way, the flexibility of those batteries in something that's both necessary and sufficient, right? So meaning that it's, it, it's equivalent, but it's more convenient to use. Well, that's something we did in this, uh, in this work. And what we're trying to do now is to create, you know, to, to, to basically create little Lego blocks like that and then construct them into something we can start trading. And again, I apologize for having to be very brief here, uh, but ultimately what we'd like to do is two things. We'd like to have a scheme in which we have units, aggregators and some kind of high level control. So we'd like to aggregate up, right? We'd like to say, well, if this little device can do this, this one can do this, this one can do this. We can combine it into something bigger. We can combine those into something bigger uh, in a hierarchy. And at some point we can then, you know, issue this dispatch orders from the top. And we have three stages. We have on the one, first we can aggregate what can these devices really do. We can then, you know, offer that on some market or in some other way. We can then let the, let's say the system operator or your distribution grid operator say, hey, I'd like to reserve this capability because I might need it, let's say tomorrow. And finally, in real time, they can dispatch this, um, this behavior that you, that they requested. So that's the three stage process over there. There's more in the, in this paper, I'm happy to talk more. Um, I'll skip this in a few of the time. So let me just wrap up. Um, so in summary, uh, network congestion is real and urgent. Uh, we need to do something about it. Many partial solutions are available, um, each one with their own pluses and minuses. And uh, 
a, a, a perfect solution does not exist here, right? So we need to see what the options are, map them out, and at some point make some decisions. Uh, and they might differ in different places in the world with different uh, um, yeah, priorities. Um, smart charging vehicle to grid are super powerful options. So uh, we should use them and actually, you know, if vice versa, if we don't use them, we're in for some real trouble uh, because of the amount of power that these vehicles control. Um, and I do think that fundamental challenges remain in flexibility aggregation. So um, yeah, current research is, is needed there and maybe some interesting student projects will definitely be in that space as well. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done in various disciplines. And yeah, I'll just like to end here yeah, by thanking the various organizations that made this possible. Uh, and have a bunch of references here, but I guess you'll see this in the recording or you can get those slides later. Thank you, and Simon, for your great presentation. And, and for, sorry for the confusion as well. Uh, Dr. Zach, Professor Dr. Zakir Rader has also a presentation. So I want to give the floor again to Professor Zakir, but uh, it's, it should be a maximum 50 minutes due to time limitations. And okay. I think the yeah, floor is yours, Professor Dr. Zakir Rader. I'll stop sharing. Apologies, I had 20 minutes in my mind, so uh, that's why I went for 20. <laughs> Here you go. Thank you, and um, sorry for the confusion. I was not fully sure about the format. I think now I'll just share my slides. <clears throat> Please let me know if you can see the presentation in uh, the presentation mode. We can see it. Perfect. So, uh, Professor Simon, um, you know, gave a very interesting and broader perspective of uh, this sector coupled system and the flexibility need for flexibility, which is which is a key actually to to handle this multi carrier uh, energy. Uh, vector system where we have on one hand electricity, uh, gas, water, transportation, everything you know coming together. Uh, so therefore, flexibility is 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 a kind of you know a must necessity now for uh, operating this grid or you can say electrical energy system as a whole. And here I'm I'm going to talk uh, more about the uh, um, specific aspects of the electric vehicles and how potentially because this electric vehicle you know few decades ago uh, or several decades ago when these distribution systems were actually designed by different utilities they hardly had in mind uh, that there's going to be a huge load coming up from the vehicle side on the electrical grid so therefore the utilities utility grids have not been designed to cater uh, this additional electric vehicle load that is now coming up very rapidly uh, towards the electrical grid side. So I'll touch up on, on those aspects and I'll try to stick to the time as much as I can. Please stop me uh, if I'm you know, crossing uh, the, the set time. So this slide gives a bit uh, um, statistics of this electric uh, vehicle charging, uh, sorry, electric, um, uh, vehicle charging points because electric vehicles the, the main interfacing point between electric vehicles and the grid is these chargers charging points you can see here in this plot globally uh, there are of course slow chargers rapid chargers and slow medium fast ultra fast and all those different kinds of categories depending on the power uh, level and the time it takes to charge a specific battery you can see that the the level of Fast chargers actually has, though it is slow plus fast, but predominantly fast is actually growing more and more in, in the in case of public charging, particularly. We have home charging also predominantly, uh, but at home charging, it is uh, relatively medium charging level, or you can say slow charging to start with. Uh, but there also at home charging, you have uh, now more and more capacity chargers coming up because of the higher and higher capacity of the battery that is getting added to these new EV models that are dominating the market and that trend is going to continue. Therefore, the level of chargers 
capacity of chargers is going to increase. What does that indirectly mean? More and more load on the distribution side, and that actually concerns the, the grid operator. Uh, earlier presentation was mentioning about congestion, and this is going to increase the congestion in the distribution system as you add more and more you know, electric vehicles um, into the system. So, um, for example, there is uh, this infrastructure uh, plan by US recently, um, which is talking about establishing on, on interstate highways charging stations of uh, having minimum of four uh, charging points and each of minimum of 150 kilowatt capacity. That means minimum capacity of the charging station is going to be 600 kilowatt. Now imagine that so many char such charging stations getting connected to the grid is, is actually a huge load on, on the grid side. Okay, so uh, this is the, the statistics of the Indian uh, AV ecosystem. We have a uh, little over 100,000 pure electric vehicles and around 4.5, uh, uh, you know, uh, 464,000 uh, 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 PSVs, that's um, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. And at the moment, the, the majority share of you know more than 72 73 percent of these electric vehicles are two wheelers and three wheelers uh, in the country and uh, four wheelers are actually growing as we move forward and we also have uh, some ambitious targets to to move towards this electric mobility in India and there's a lot of development happening uh, at the moment in, in the electric vehicle ecosystem space in, in Indian uh, in India so uh, to give a glimpse of the Indian grid, we have a total installed capacity of around 400 gigawatt. Um, and you can see we have come a long way from around one gigawatt uh, to, to around 400 gigawatt, which is actually growing rapidly. And peak demand in India is around 207 gigawatt experienced recently um, uh, during the summer season, because again, uh, there was an unusual uh, hot weather this time, and we had a lot of increase in, in, the, in the peak demand uh, experienced by the country. Coming to the renewables, we have had a target of 175 gigawatt of renewables by 2022. Um, and 450 gigawatt we have targeted by 2030 from renewables, which is primarily solar and wind, 500 gigawatt from non-fossil fuel based sources. At the moment, if you uh, count electric, uh, sorry, hydro also in renewables, then we have around 150 gigawatt of renewable capacity, but if it is solar and wind only, then it is around 110 gigawatt in installed capacity. So we have a plan uh, of going big way in, in the renewables in the system, and that brings the, the, the issue of that flexibility and all that increased flexibility that the grid requires to handle. And on top of that, we are adding the electric vehicle. So EV load is a bit unique load. It's not a conventional load because we have a full we have a control flexibility on the EV load we can control the load drawn by the EV and we can also depending on the technology you know pump back the power to the grid where we call this V2G vehicle to grid which was being mentioned in the, in the first presentation so therefore this is a bit you know different load and it needs to be accordingly kind of understood and tackled in, in the system this is the list of, I'll not go into details in the interest of time, it's the list of issues, technical issues that these electric vehicles bring in, uh, in, in the distribution system. Um, so this is one of the case study you can see here uh, done in Hamburg, Germany, um, which, uh, which, uh, which concluded that uh, if there is a 9% increase in EV share uh, with this corresponding addition of it, which, which corresponds to around 60,000 uh, EVs, that would result in a bottleneck in, you know, that's bottleneck here would mean the, the loading of the distribution transform 15% of the feeders in, in the steel distribution network will have this issue. So that, that drives the attention to that congestion that we we're talking earlier, this, this electric vehicles, if not handled carefully, are going to actually uh, deteriorate the situation. Um, now, no, uh, Understanding that we have this lot of issues with the EV charging, if we have uncontrolled charging or dumb charging, where we a user in the evening just comes up and connects to the charging point to the to the to the charger, and then it's coinciding with the peak load, that's going to be a very uh, difficult situation for the grid operator. So therefore, how to handle this additional load of EVs that is being brought into the electrical side? 
So one option one could think is uh, grid reinforcement. You increase the capacity of the grid and let the more and more load come into, but that's easier said than, said than you know, done because there's a lot of cost implications involved in grid infrastructure upgradation. So therefore it's not a straightforward option. There's a lot of cost factor involved in it. So what is the other way to handle it? So this smart charging provides us one excellent alternative to handle this charging of the electric vehicles, lot, lot of electric vehicles in a more effective manner if we can coordinate and you know, handle it uh, in a better way. These are some of the definition of smart charging of electric vehicles, but basically in a layman's language, it is like you, you coordinate the charging of the electric vehicles um, through communication, through some set time, or through some price signals, so that you are avoiding the, the congestions or the impact on the distribution system in terms of voltage, power quality, and other factors uh, by a coordinated or smart charging of these electric vehicles. There are some of the different types of smart chargings. You have, uh, for example, uncontrolled, which is creating an issue uh, with, with this the, the distribution system as well as the transmission system. And then you have some in case, uh, you know, basic control where you have simple on and off operation. Uh, and then you can use it, it with, for the grid support. Uh, you have unidirectional controlled charging, which is a smart charging where you have only charging capability but you can control how much current the charger can draw from the grid. So you, that gives us a flexibility to control the load drawn from the grid. And then you have vehicle to grid where you are able to inject back the power to the grid and you can potentially help in handling the peak power uh, events during the evening hours. You can, you know, you can pump the power to the grid and, and uh, address those congestion issues. Then we have additional vehicle to anything, let us say vehicle to building, vehicle to, uh, home vehicle to load or any vehicle to other source, they can you know, supply locally from, from the battery of the electric vehicle that remains, if it's a private vehicle, unutilized for most of the time during a day. And then you have through pricing, you can have the time of day, you know, time sensitive pricing, or you can have dynamic pricing depending on the load that will force or motivate the users to charge only during you know, low peak hours or off peak hours when the prices are going to be low. So we have done some analysis at IIT Bombay in the smart charging. So we, we, we categorize the, the requirement for smart, establishing smart charging in the three you know, factors here. Technical requirements are there, which are very important core to this issue. Then there is equally important that regulatory requirements should be there. Should be sufficient regulations in place which will allow the smart charging to take place. And then, of course, the role of the stakeholders is, is a key factor in, in, um, in, in implementing uh, or realizing the smart charging of electric vehicles. This is one of the case study done in, by one of the utilities in, in US, where they are addressing this duck curve. I'm not going to, into that duck curve issue. Most, many of, most of you probably, I assume, are aware of the issues of this duck curve because of the solar PV penetration. In the system, they are trying to address this duck curve issue by uh, smart charging. It's a time-based tariff. Uh, you can see during off-peak hours, the price is low, which, which encourages more uh, users to charge their electric vehicle. And during evening hours, when there's a peak load here, you are charged heavily and you are discouraged to charge around that time. So they are trying to address this belly issue of the duck curve and this flexibility issue here at the ramp requirement by by smart charging uh, of these electric vehicles. Uh, similarly, there is one uh, case study in, in UK, which is also you know, addressing the same issue, uh, trying to utilize these electric vehicles to help the grid operator manage the grid. Uh, this is one of the case study in you know, Amsterdam, uh, where there is these 456 charging stations with around 912 charging points uh, being used to actually uh, have smart charging and uh, address some of these uh, issues that the grid is actually experiencing either originally without EVs or being aggravated by, by electric vehicle uncontrolled uh, you know, load. There are other various, um, uh, various um, uses that this vehicle to grid or vehicle to anything can help us in, in managing the grid, not only managing the grid, but also can help us accommodating more renewable energy uh, uh, generation in the system. Uh, so therefore, to conclude, uh, this vehicle electrification is, is rapidly growing that 
we see every uh, almost in every country of course at a different pace for example some of the european countries are much ahead of you know some of the other countries uh, but the 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 noise or the activities happening towards the electric mobility is happening almost everywhere uh, then of course it brings various challenges technical challenges and non technical challenges that need to be addressed and smart charging actually you know provides one of the uh, effective alternative option to handle this lot of electric vehicle load not only handle this electric vehicle load but also uh, help in better renewable energy integration and grid management because of its capabilities that actually actually it offers uh, due to the fact that it is a unique type of load not any conventional load where you have a control on the charging and you can potentially also pump the power back to the to the grid so um, with this i would uh, like to conclude i hope i didn't take too much time uh, and i will leave the floor back to the thank you thank you so much professor huzakir radir and it's very nice and very appealing uh, presentation about the ev charging and right now uh, the floor is going to be rahbar katayor from the emission digital Hello everyone. Let me share my screen. Yes, we see it. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, okay. hi everyone. My name is Katya. I'm from Envision Digital. Uh, a little background about myself. I joined Envision in uh, January 2020. Uh, and uh, currently i'm leading the grid optimization team uh, which is uh, mostly focusing on designing of uh, algorithms for the optimization engine that are uh, key building blocks uh, of um, our um, uh, smart grid solutions so before i go to uh, to more technical stuff and provide you details about our product let me just uh, give a quick interview Uh, uh, overview of the Envision. Envision Group is a global leading company in green uh, technology and uh, aims to solve uh, the challenges for the sustainable uh, future. Um, uh, specifically, Envision Energy is the uh, world leading uh, smart wind turbine uh, as well as battery energy storage system provider. Uh, it has over more than uh, the 3 um, gigawatts uh, of uh, wind power in operation envision asc uh, provides aiot battery energy storage solutions its uh, uh, um, lithium ion uh, batteries uh, have been installed over 600000 electric vehicles all around the world with zero cri uh, critical incidents over the last 11 years uh, envision energy Uh, is a leading software company providing digital solutions uh, for energy systems it's uh, headquartered in singapore and um, uh, connects um, uh, more than uh, 110 million smart devices uh, with over 360 gigawatt power through its flexible iot platform uh, envision venture and envision racing are also part of envision uh, group Uh, Envision Digital has a very strong global uh, presence. It uh, has uh, more than 45 customers over uh, 45 uh, 450 customers over 45 countries. Um, um, we also um, uh, cover more than 80% um, of the uh, future uh, 500 companies basically 80% of these uh, future uh, 500 companies are our client uh, we also cover 30% of the top uh, energy uh, and utility companies uh, about our talents um, envision digital has almost 1000 employees or with uh, 29 nationalities over 12 offices all around the world specifically in singapore china and several offices in europe uh, such as um, the netherlands and uk uh, as a, a leading company in uh, green tech um, uh, r&d is uh, of high importance to us that's why more than 75% of uh, envision digital employees are uh, r&d engineers 
Uh, we have several um, projects uh, globally. Uh, so due to time constraints, I cannot go to each individual one. Let me just uh, open up one of them, uh, uh, which is uh, quite interesting. The one which is the Keppel uh, project is um, for the Keppel offshore marine uh, in Singapore. Uh, so basically this uh, project um, tries to integrate uh, battery energy storage systems, solar PV panels, as well as the LNG generators on the floating living lab. So floating living lab is basically a floating deck and floats, uh, which floats on the water and can uh, move around and support the different uh, shipyard load systems. Uh, so for this system, uh, the, besides the objectives of energy efficiency, how to optimize these different uh, assets together and provide the optimal operation planning uh, for not only uh, hours ahead, but also to minutes and seconds resolution. One of the key challenges is uh, how we are going to keep the system and all this optimization running uh, whenever there is um, the limited, uh, or in, uh, limited or intermittent connection with the cloud. Uh, because for these kind of setups, we need to mostly rely uh, on our edge solution. So our optimization engine should be lightweight because the computational complexity um, cannot, may not be fully handled or uh, be uh, addressed by the edge uh, solution rather than the, um, um, all the resources that we have in cloud computing. Uh, so um, th this project, the outcome would uh, really change the um, business of the future of the yards. Let me go back. Okay. Uh, so here is one of our key products, and the name is uh, NOS Flex. Uh, is actually the um, uh, for the, um, the management and optimization of behind the meter distributed energy resources. Uh, it has three key sub products: uh, microgrid controller. Uh, which is running on our edge and uh, AR microgrid and uh, uh, trading advisor, which is our VPP, which, are, uh, which are, these two are running on cloud. So before I provide more uh, information and insight about uh, each of these um, uh, sub products, let me just uh, highlight the key differentiators between our product uh, with the ones existing in the market. So one key differentiator is that um, typically we have uh, uh, several types of assets. So we have a very smooth and efficient asset onboarding process. Uh, we are able to um, uh, onboard different types of assets, almost anything that is available in the market, including battery energy storage systems, um, charging stations, EV charging stations, uh, so, solar, wind, uh, and as well as the thermal assets, for example, CHP or heat pump. And so this uh, uh, on device on uh, boarding process is actually enabled through the domain knowledge and expertise that we have in-house. Another key differentiator of our product is um, about the uh, advanced um, the optimization algorithms uh, that are um, running um, uh, on the back end for our product. Uh, so basically we uh, um, uh, leverage on the cloud and edge and computing to uh, jointly optimize the uh, distributed um, uh, DERs and, and also come up with the optimal operation planning from days to hours to minutes and even seconds uh, resolution. And uh, our solution is also uh, very flexible. For example, we can enable different uh, features, um, peak shaving, price arbitrage, um, minimization of the carbon emissions, maximization of the um, renewable self-consumptions, uh, as well as different um, uh, market participations like uh, regulation market, reserve market. And um, uh, beside this, we also have a solution for the VPP, the aggregations and market participation. Uh, the third key differentiator um, uh, compared to the other existing solutions is uh, our strong track record um, uh, for implementation in, for different projects. So we have implemented uh, this uh, product for various uh, big projects and, and uh, we are somehow confident that these solutions are commercially um, uh, available and ready to be used and customers for other use cases as well. 
so with this background of the product, I want to provide more um, insight of two of our sub products, mostly the ones that are running on cloud, which are AI microgrid uh, and also the uh, trading advisor, our VPP. So uh, our AR microgrid, as I mentioned, is running on cloud, is a cloud solution. It jointly optimizes the uh, um, distributed uh, energy resources uh, like the distributed wind, solar, uh, thermal assets like uh, CHP and heat pump, controllable loads, those loads that we are able to optimize the energy consumption, the energy storage system, and gen set. So um, um, through this uh, product, we are also able to uh, configure different features. Like we want to, uh, uh, our objective is to maximize the, uh, the renewable local consumptions, minimize the carbon emissions, or we are going, uh, um, and or we are going to provide um, some uh, ancillary services like frequency regulation or reserve or we have other objectives like cost arbitrage, uh, whether we have demand response. Uh, so through this um, solution, we are able to configure the different features, different objectives based on the business requirements. And um, uh, from the backend engine, it will go through the uh, comprehensive mathematical modeling and the joint optimization of these assets to make sure all those bus uh, business requirements uh, are fulfilled. Uh, so this was mostly on the asset level optimization, whether we consider the individual assets uh, into account. So uh, we also have another application uh, and solution running on cloud, which is our uh, trading advisor. So assume that we do not want to, uh, to do the asset level optimization. We have, the, uh, we have, for example, tens of battery energy storage sy system. We have uh, several, and um, maybe uh, the hundreds of uh, solar uh, PV panels of the wind turbines. And so we, and we want to um, have a, a pr proper way to systematically uh, aggregate all these assets. And once this aggregate uh, chain is done, we have the upward and downward power capacity that this upward and downward power capacities enable us to participate in different markets. For example, um, frequency regulation market or contingency reserve market, different types of market. And we also need to uh, perform the optimal bidding strategy. And once the bidding result is out, we need to have proper algorithms, how to dispatch again, all the way to the size and to the asset level. So all these solutions end to end from aggregation to bidding strategies and to the uh, dispatching the um, outcome of the markets and results, the uh, um, bid results. Uh, to the assets level or are enabled through our, this, uh, our sub product, which is the uh, trading advisor. So with this, I also want to highlight the uh, several internship opportunities within Envision Digital. It's quite diverse uh, in uh, different domains. And specifically, we have two full-time open positions within grid optimization team that I'm part of. Uh, so if you are uh, interested, uh, in joining Envision and uh, work on these exciting uh, projects and products, uh, please uh, feel free to scan this QR code uh, where you can uh, get connected to um, the company and know more about uh, our uh, open positions. So that's all from my side for today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Rapar Katorin, for your great presentation. Right now, we have a 15 minutes Q&A session. So if you have any questions, uh, you can type into the group chat and I can ask directly to the professors and the Rahman, or you can just unmute yourself and just raise your hand. I'll unmute you and you can ask directly. The first question is to Professor Tindemans about, uh, it's in the chat, and but I'm gonna read it again. How do you expect the grid to behave with lots of EVs drawing charts simultaneously at almost at the same time? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, um, I, I guess uh, um, 
SAK also showed uh, uh, badly <laughs> if they if they if you really do 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 dumb charging in a certain uh, you know take the current grid add lots of EVs and then charge at the same time then things go wrong uh, that, that that's clear so um, I expect that we need to do something right so you don't just get here to, from here to there in one day um, we'll install these things uh, and I guess what might happen and one example is this flex power thing. Is is where you simply limit the charging rate. Well, I guess that's you know that works perhaps to some extent, but it's very suboptimal. Um, so yeah, what we hopefully will do is indeed find a way to efficiently, uh, yeah, to efficiently spread out these charging uh, moments depending on the current capacity in the in, in the grid where you are. Um, so that's yeah, that's what I hope we should do. But it doesn't you know. It doesn't happen by itself, so we have to actually act for that. And I, I guess the, the big challenge there is um, also managing people's expectations, right? So how can we manage that there's a kind of social technical aspect here? Um, you know, what when you know, what do people want in, in terms of their charging uh, charge level uh, when they park a vehicle, and how do we integrate that into into the system? Uh, do we expect them to uh, indicate whenever they leave their vehicle when they will need it and then it becomes basically their fault if they don't say you know, if they don't give the right information then it's okay or do we kind of proactively estimate when they will leave but you know chances are that you might be wrong and and what does that do and there are proposals for some minimum charge level right that you must at least charge to some level and then you can do smart charging again it's suboptimal right so all of these things are suboptimal the question is what do you do uh, the nice thing there and then I'll stop uh, but the nice thing there is that I do think there's a special opportunity for these shared vehicle schemes uh, because it's, you know, whether it's a company or, or you know, residential uh, user shared vehicle scheme, uh, because it doesn't matter so much if one of the vehicles isn't fully charged. Um, you can always say, well, if you if you want a fully charged vehicle, you know, one block away, there's one that has a full charge, uh, but the one in your street, it has, you know, whatever, 40 percent charge. If you just want to go to you know the next town, it's fine, um, and and you have some more flexibility that way. Thank you for your answer. Uh, I think Shin Yini asked the question. Are you satisfied with the answer, Shin Yini? Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions, guys? If there is no question, I would extend the question about the, how the demand side management can tackle the problem about the, using the charger simultaneously. I'll let one of the other speakers take the lead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I'll, I'll start with, with there is overlap between the previous question and this this question as well. So I think to some extent that, that question was answered in my presentation, how we can tackle this lot of charging, EV charging load through smart charging. Um, we can coordinate the charging of electric vehicles in such a way that it does not overload the network, the distribution network that we have. Now, if you leave it uncontrolled, as I mentioned, what would happen is EV users will normally charge it at the evening hours and evening hours are peak hours uh, in terms of the load. So therefore, it's going to deteriorate the, the uh, congestion further if we leave it uncontrolled charging. So this smart charging offers an option to uh, allow a coordinated charging. So for example, what does that coordinate charging mean? You do not charge your electric vehicle in the evening peak hours. You could, because during the night, you anyway are not going to use the electric vehicle if it is a home charging. Um, you could actually leave the vehicle connected to the grid and the, the, the charging point can be set such that it charges after the peak uh, period is over. That is, let us say, late night hours. For example, 11, it varies from city to city and country to country. For example, 11 
11 p.m. Uh, to the midnight in, in those hours when the load is going to be low. So therefore, you, you kind of shift that load from the peak hours to the off-peak hours, and that improves your peak to average ratio uh, of the you know, uh, daily load duration curve. Uh, that's one way. And now this can be done, as I mentioned, one simple way, which is, for example, in India, and many places it's already in place. In some other parts in India also, we call it time of day tariff. Means you have high charging prices, the, the tariff for the electricity that you, you use for charging the electric vehicle in the peak hours is high. And during the off peak hours, it is low. So then you are kind of motivated or forced to charge your electric vehicle during off peak hours when the distribution system is having a good enough margin to, to provide the, the load to your you know, electric vehicle. Now, coming back to this demand response, so electric vehicle load offers an excellent opportunity for demand response. As I mentioned, it, we have it categorized in terms of the control capability, electric vehicle charges into three categories. One is V0G, which is a dumb charger. It doesn't have any control. It just draws the power and you connect it to the grid. Second category is V1G, which is a smart uh, grid to vehicle charging means you, know, you are only it has a capability of unidirectional power flow it draws from the grid and charges your vehicle but you have a control over the current charging current that you can draw from the grid now if you have uh, that control in that v1g category depending on various factors you can get uh, let us say we talk of public charging station uh, it is having a capacity of, for example, 600 kilowatt. Now, if there is a demand response required by the grid, uh, and there is an incentive mechanism already in place for participating in the demand response, you can actually, if your charging station is operating at its peak, that is 600 kilowatt, you can reduce technically, you can reduce your load of the charging station from 600 to zero. So you have that flexibility, pro of course, if provided that the constraints permit you AV user constraints and all those factors come into picture. But you have the capability of reducing the load by 100%. And if you have enough incentive mechanism and market in place for demand response, you can actually actively participate in demand response. Third charging category is vehicle to grid, where if we take the same charging station of 600 kilowatt capacity, it can technically change its consumption from 600 kilowatt load from drawing from the grid to 600 kilowatt pumping back to the grid. That is actually 2x uh, change in power. That around is you know, 600 into 2, uh, 1200 kilowatt change in power. You, you, you are actually net injection, if you see from the grid side, is 1200 kilowatt because 600 kilowatt is reduced and 600 is being pumped to the grid. So if you have V2G category, they can participate in, in uh, you know, that, that as well uh, in the demand response very actively. But of course, it needs incentive mechanism market in place. It needs regulations in place. For example, in India, at the moment, the electric vehicles cannot participate, you know, connect electric vehicles connected at low voltage level of small capacity cannot participate in demand response. But higher capacity loaders can participate. Similarly, we do not have at the moment in Indian you know, market like, uh, V2G capable electric vehicles, but of course, several European countries do have them. So therefore, technically they can definitely, they are a very good, uh, uh, they offer a very good opportunity uh, or alternative for demand response, provided there is an incentive mechanism, adequate market in place, and more importantly, as I mentioned, if market is there, regulations have to be in place. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zakir. The next question is gonna also be similar to this topic because it's just gonna, uh, Jacob is asking about the base load and the peak charging. So I'm gonna ask the question, what are some of differences in infrastructure that needed for base load versus peak charging? Also, how can we incorporate renewables in the charge mix as well? Okay, so, so is it question for me or? Yeah, yeah, any speaker can get it. Okay. If you have one specific question to envision for the so, next question. 
Perfect. So I'll, I'll just go uh, with this and then Simon can add to that. Um, see, um, infrastructure that's needed for base load versus peak, uh, peak charging. Um, see, the infrastructure, even without, assume the, the conventional grid without electric vehicle load, it also has off peak load and peak load. As I said, normally there are two peak out, peak loaders during the day. One is morning peak and second is evening peak. Evening peak is more than the morning peak. So peak, the, the system is always designed depending on the peak load because it should be capable of carrying out that much power. But what is EV charging doing is it is, if it is uncontrolled, it is going to add to the to that peak load, which potentially may not be handled by the existing grid. For example, I'll give you an example. There is a distribution transformer, which is loaded at 90% or 85% during the peak load hours. Means there is hardly any margin left to add more peak load. Now, if you are adding electric vehicles to that, it is going to actually potentially uh, breach the, the transformer limit. It can overload the transformer, which grid operator will not allow. So means essentially, you will not get uh, connection approval, electric vehicle charging point connection approval in, in such cases uh, until unless there is a grid infrastructure in place. Now, if it is a public charging station, there is a possibility of that public charging station operator itself is, is uh, paying for the grid upgradation. Uh, that's a possibility. But as a residential user, private user, you are hardly going to actually provide that. But in some countries, there is additional charges that are being paid by the EV users even for the home charging. So that brings in the difference, you know, with the conventional peak load, the infrastructure and the electric vehicles. So wherever there is a margin, there, there are places where your transformer is currently being you know, loaded up to 50% or even less during the peak load hours without any EV charging. So you have a margin left there in the existing transformer. So therefore, as long as it is not overloading the transformer, the distribution utility will allow EV chargers to be connected to that. Now, coming to the next part of the question, that is renewable energy based uh, uh, EV charging, which is very actually very important and relevant aspect because all the motivation, primary motivation of shifting the EV the transportation from conventional ICE vehicles to electric mobility is all because we want to actually reduce the carbon emission. Now, if your electric vehicle load is being catered by fossil fuel based plants, the whole motive that is behind this whole paradigm shift from ICE vehicles to electric vehicles is not actually served. So therefore it is very important that this electric vehicle load that we are adding to the grid are actually supplied by the renewable energy. So now how that can be done? There are different ways to you know, ensure that charging electric vehicle charging is done by renewables. One is that you have co-located uh, solar PV or wind renewable energy plant. So let us say you have a charging station uh, which has 100 charging points or 50 charging points of different capacity. Now it can have its own solar PV plant or rooftop PV system within its premises and then it caters to a large extent the charging load that's you know used by the by the charging points the other option is that you buy renewable electricity from from a generator which is gener if you're generating electricity from, from somewhere else if the market permits that for example in indian grid we have the concept of open access uh, a, a, a customer load uh, having one megawatt and above now that's actually changed now one megawatt or some minimum threshold and above, you can buy electricity from a renewable energy plant, which is located somewhere else. So through that open access or through the electricity market, you can actually capture this renewables for charging your electric vehicle. Uh, and there are various analysis which show that renewable energy based charging is uh, can potentially be you know very cost effective. So therefore, it is very important that this electric vehicle uh, load is served by renewables, whether by co-located you know, plants, uh, generation plants, or uh, by integrating into the market and buying the electricity from anywhere in the grid uh, uh, 
from the renewable energy plants. So hope that uh, answers the question to some extent. Thank you, Professor Zakir. Since we have only limited times, it's already uh, out of our time, but I want to ask uh, one specific question to emission. Does emission work with nuclear energy or are there plans for emission to work with nuclear energy? Yeah, the, the answer is no. So nuclear is not part of our roadmap. Okay, maybe I can continue for a few minutes uh, from the Chan Rick. To each of the three speakers, how are smart grids related to the circular economy? What are the possible impacts on the circular economy on the local, regional, and global scales? Justify in detail broadly and deeply. Unfortunately, for the deep answer, we don't have enough time, but you can answer. Yeah. Who wants to uh, to kick things off? Maybe Katya you wants to start. Otherwise, I can. Uh... Yeah. You have a few more words. Yeah, but... please, Prof. Please go ahead. Thanks. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Uh, yeah. So, so, so I think, um, in some sense, it is, I think, a a necessary ingredient for a circular economy, um, or at least, right? So, you want to you want to make most efficient, or at least, or, or in the ideal case, reuse all your resources. That also implies, I guess, you want to use your resources as efficiently as as possible. And that means that, yeah, if you, rather than just, you know, building a grid to cope with whatever fluctuations, you try to manage those fluctuations to, to fit within the grid you have. Um, so there, I think, you know, in that direction, it, it, it's essential. Um, doesn't mean that smart grid is necessarily uh, circular uh, or sustainable. Um, so, yeah, that's, that will be my answer in the time we have. <laughs> hope, that, uh, hope that's sufficient. Uh, for the last question, maybe I can ask this one and we can conclude. It's for Simon again. Do you think biofuels hydrogen vehicles will disrupt the EVs and nullify the investment in increasing grid capacity for EVs? Um, good question. I think um, I think not uh, for multiple reasons. I think we don't only we do not only do this for EVs, uh, the, the investments. Um, so even if everyone were, were to switch to hydrogen, et cetera. We still have, uh, for example, heating and cooling uh, moving onto uh, electricity, especially heating in these uh, in countries like, like the Netherlands or most of Europe, um, moving to uh, from gas to, to, to electricity. So that's, uh, that's also necessary for that. Second, it, and again, I'm not an expert on this, but I do have the impression that for most short trips, uh, electricity, battery electric vehicles rather than uh, hydrogen vehicles seem to be the way to go uh, unless some other resource constraints of course pop up maybe that would change things um, I do hear that there's there's a, a good niche potentially for long-term transport uh, on hydrogen but I'm not sure uh, on the details of that so I think um, I don't see that as the biggest risk no, or a, a, as a large risk Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for great uh, presentation. And thank you for uh, audiences as well, because they are uh, sharing their valuable time with us. So we will conclude the first round of today and we're gonna continue at 11.30. Uh, that's why we have 10 minute, five minutes uh, break right now, coffee break. Enjoy your break and see you at 11.30. Thank you again for hosting me and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be signing off here, uh, continuing my holidays, but uh, thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Thank you.